So this video is going to cover the theory behind what stack memory is and how it works, which is key to reverse engineering malware. This is something, I'll be honest, that took a while for me to understand the concept of, so please don't be discouraged if this is something that at first doesn't click straight away with yourself. You may need to watch the video a few times, and also the next video is going to contain practical examples using a sample of Emotet malware we have unpacked in previous videos. So, from previous videos I've explained that malware is made up of a number of functions written by a malware author. Or the malware may even import legitimate Windows API functionality. And a couple of reasons for doing this is could be that the malware is going to create some files on disk, or perhaps connect to the internet to download additional malware, or perhaps exfiltrate data. And these functions are going to have local variables, parameters, and perhaps data stored in registers that they may, they may need to reference. So, for example, if a piece of malware is using a function which connects to the bad guy's C2 server, then that domain or IP address will need to be referenced by the function which is going to make that network connection. The C2 address will need to be pushed onto the stack in order for the function to reference it. And this is where stack memory comes into malware analysis. The pushing and removing of data on the stack is often referred to as LIFO, last in, first out. And just think of this as a bunch of building bricks stacked on top of one another. You can't take from the middle of the stack as the stack will fall. So the last brick placed on top has to first be removed. And this is how the stack works. When data is added to the stack, the command used is the push command. And to remove an item off the stack, the pop command is used. And data can also be popped off the stack and into a register. You'll also see the ESP register, which points to the next item on the stack, and this is known as a stack pointer. And what you'll also see is the EVP register, which is known as the frame pointer. And this is gonna serve as an unchanging reference point for data on the stack. And what we're also gonna see as well is you'll see that each function will generate its own stack frame to reference its own variables. Now again, don't be too concerned if that doesn't click straight to where it doesn't immediately make sense. Like I say, I'm gonna explain a little further in the next slide and like I say the next video is going to have practical examples which will make this all a lot clearer. So what I'm hoping is the following diagram should help illustrate how the stack works. Lower memory addresses are on top and higher memory addresses are at the bottom. Each function will generate its own stack frame. So this stack frame could be on top of another frame on the stack. And EVP, as I mentioned earlier, is stored as an unchanging reference point on the stack. And this is done by moving the value of ESP, the stack pointer, into EVP. And we do this as ESP will change and it's always pointing to the top of the stack. So storing it in EVP gives us an unchanging reference point there on the stack. Once EVP is saved to the stack, the function is then able to reference variables and parameters on the stack from this location. So parameters that have been passed to the uh, function in this example are stored in EBP plus 8, EBP plus 12 and EBP plus 16. So when we see EBP plus 8, that is the distance on the stack from EBP. Now the difference between parameters and variables is that variables will be stored after the function has begun. So these will be stored higher up the stack, but in lower address space. So in this example, we can see here, it's shown as EBP minus four. So higher up the stack, but in lower address space. Again, to try and help illustrate this even further, I've got a simple C program here, which calls a function called add func. And all it does is adds two numbers together, one and four, and then prints the output to the screen. Focusing on the add func function code, there are two parameters here, a and b, and these are passed as arguments. And there's a local variable of c, which is where the result is stored. So let's say that code gets compiled and put in a debugger. And here we can see what this program would look like. So the first three lines are what's known as the function prologue. And this is where space is created on the stack for the function. So push EBP preserves ESP the previous stack frame pointer, and this is so it can be returned to at the end of the function. A stack frame, like I say, is used to store local variables, and each function will have its own stack frame in memory. 
The next command down of the push EVP is move EVP ESP. This moves the current stack position into EVP, which is the base of the stack. And as I said before, we now have a reference point which allows us to reference our local variables stored on the stack. And the value of EVP now never changes. The third command we can see there is sub ESP 10. So this grows the stack by 16 bytes, which is 10 in hex. And again, like I said before, this is used to allocate space on the stack for any variables that we need to reference. And this is what the stack looks like for this program. So in this example, we can see by looking at the stack, we've been allocated space for four variables. So we have there EBP minus four, minus eight, minus C, and minus 10. However, we only have one variable, which is int C, which is located at EBP minus four. Just back to the um, top for the assembly instructions, I just want to focus on move EDX, and then you can see here it's referencing EBP plus eight. So what's happening here is we're moving int A, which is the value one, into the EDX register. The important part here is EBP plus eight in the brackets. The square brackets mean you are directly addressing the memory at this location. So this is referencing the location in memory that is eight bytes higher up the stack than what is in EBP. And if you remember from previous slide, parameters that are passed to a function will always be in a higher address space, which is lower down the stack. Our parameters int a and int b were passed to the function before the stack frame was created. So this is why they reside in EBP plus eight and EBP plus c. We then have move EAX EBP plus C, which is the same as above, although we're now referencing EBP plus C, which is int B, the value four, and we're moving that into the EAX register. We then have the addition. So we have add EAX EDX, like I said, performs the addition and stores the results in the EAX register. We then have move EBP minus four EAX, and here we're moving the results stored in EAX into a local variable, which is int C. And the local variable C is defined within the function. Therefore, it's in a lower memory address than the top of the stack. And therefore, because it's inside the stack frame and is of size four bytes, we can just use some of the space we allocated for the variables earlier by subtracting 10 from ESP. And in this case, use EVP minus four. We then have move EAX EBP minus four, and most functions return with the value stored in EAX. So where above the return value is in EAX, and we moved it to a variable C, here it's just putting it back again into EAX ready to return. Then we have the leave instruction. This is actually a mask for an operation which moves EBP back into ESP, and pops it off the stack. So prepping the stack frame of the function that called this function. And then we have the return instruction. And this just jumps to the return address to go back to the call E function, which has a nicely preserved stack frame because we remembered it at the start of this function. So again, that's like the theory behind it, a quick overview. And as I said at the start, this didn't click with me straight away. Um, but by watching this video and the next one, this should hopefully become a lot clearer as we see the stack being used by malware. Like I say, the next video is going to show some practical examples, which will make this a lot clearer. However, I just felt it was important to create a short video on the theory behind how this all works first before we start diving into how it works within X64. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.